Hey, thank you for joining us at odessabible.org on our YouTube channel and Facebook, however you're watching this. We're glad that you've joined us, and thank you for being consistent in that. Please send us your comments. Uh, we'd love to hear back from you. Uh, we don't know exactly how many people are watching or where you're watching from, but that helps encourage us knowing that you're out there and, and that we hope and pray that this whole uh, season in our country with COVID and all that else is going on passes soon and we're able to, to restore fellowship in ways that we've so enjoyed for literally thousands of years. And so we pray that that happens to us soon. But remain faithful. I wanted to let you know the little things that are going on at our church. We're starting a Super Supper 6 event over the course of the next few weeks. And we want you to be involved in that. And of course, that's if you're here in town. We want you to be involved in this. It's when couples get together of three or three couples, that makes the six, get together for supper. And it's super. And that's the idea there. And uh, if you'd like to be involved in that, I want to invite you to go to our website. Uh, you can sign up there. And it's just a way. And small groups because we're we're uh, able to do that small groups in different homes uh, and have a great time of fellowship more details are listed on the website each couple hosts once a month uh, we're gonna start this on July 10th that's the last day to sign up uh, and so it's gonna be a blast and so I encourage you to do that it lasts for three months uh, July August and September you'll get together with a different couple at a different house and then we'll reshuffle the deck and do it a different way and so I encourage you to do that we need to make sure that we're fellowshipping one with another and in a small setting like this uh, uh, it'll be great uh, for you, for your family. So look at the details at odessabible.org. Uh, the tour of Texas for our youth uh, has hit a big snag as COVID cases rise in Odessa and Texas altogether. Lots of the venues that Zach had so diligently planned and looked into are either uh, reduced in their uh, attendance allowance or they're not open at all or they're requiring things that we just don't think would be fun at all. Uh, it would kind of ruin the whole event. And so we've had to cancel both of those tour of Texas. The one that was in July and the one that was in August. And we're pretty discouraged about that, but not depressed. We think God's doing great things. Our group is still meeting on Wednesday nights. Look forward to that fellowship. The kids are getting together. It's so important that they come every Wednesday night to see one another. Kids, students need to see one another, encourage each other in their faith. So I want to encourage you to continue to bring them. We're going through all the health uh, guidelines. We're employing those on Wednesday nights, trying to create a very safe and fun environment uh, on Wednesday nights. So please uh, keep bringing them, but we're going to have to do something different on the tour of Texas, but Zach did his best. Uh, it's just things obviously outside of our control uh, that happen that we can't contain. I want to thank Oscar for his service here at the life of our church. We're glad that he has been here. We know that today is his last Sunday at Odessa Bible Church, and we look forward to uh, what God has next for us. But thank you, Oscar, for your diligence, and we pray God's blessing upon you, and we look forward to what God's going to be doing in the life of Odessa Bible Church as uh, he brings us a new man to lead us in worship on Sunday morning. So God bless you. Have a great day this morning. Watch in the service. I pray that it's encouraging to you and that you'll have a great week. Praise the Lord, everybody. Greatest day in history Death is beaten You have rescued me Sing it out Jesus is alive Across the empty grave, life eternal, you have won the day. Shout it out, Jesus is alive. Come on, He's alive. Oh, happy day, happy day. You wash my sin away. And oh, happy day, happy day. Forever I am changed When I stand When I stand in that place Free at last, meeting face to face I'm yours, Jesus, you are This joy and perfect peace Earthly pain finally will cease Celebrate Jesus is alive He's alive Oh, happy day, happy day You washed my sin away Oh, happy day Forever I am changed Oh, what a glorious day
day What a glorious way That you have saved me Oh, what a glorious day What a glorious name Well, hello again, Odessa Bible Church and all those who are watching this, wherever you might be. We're so glad that you've joined us again today. We have lots of things coming up in the life of our church. One of them I want to mention just real briefly is that is a treasure camp uh, for our students, our little littles, uh, pre-K through fifth grade. Uh, uh, coming up on July 14, 15, and 16. And we'd love to invite you to be a part of that. You can go to odessabible.org to find out more information, but it's also for the moms and dads, married couples. Uh, we're gonna be doing a marriage conference, parenting conference at the same time. So the kids are gonna break off and go to a, a camp right here on campus. And then moms and dads, we want you to stay. Uh, we wanna be able to help prepare you in your marriage and prepare your kids. And so we wanna be able to transfer some of the of these parenting skills and uh, communicate what makes marriage work. And we're doing this with New Life Church. Uh, that's uh, my friend, Pastor Tim Halstead and uh, his ministry. And uh, you'll enjoy hearing him and seeing him. And uh, we're going to have a great time. So I want you to go and sign up and be a part of that. Uh, you can go to odessabible.org and see more of those details. I want to take you to your Bibles this morning and uh, remind you that we're in the book of Romans. And we started that just a few weeks ago before Father's Day. And we talked about uh, Romans chapter 1, uh, 1 through 3, verse 20. And we looked at that and uh, asked a simple question, how much more can you take? And uh, it's kind of comical, but since then, I've noticed that things are Things are getting worse. Have you noticed that too? Uh, two weeks ago, we drilled down on the condition of man and left here really with a gloom and doom feeling. Uh, usually on a sermon, I, I try to be encouraging and inspiring and, and help you feel like God is doing great things. But after that sermon, I went home sad <laughs> because we talked about how bad man is. Uh, we looked at Romans chapter three. Uh, there is none who seeks God. All have turned aside. They've all become useless. There is no one who does good, not even one. And then everything begins to unravel in our society, only proving that Scripture is accurate, written thousands of years ago, and it's still relevant today, that man is getting worse. He's messed up, and things are getting worse. And there's lots of different ways you can look at uh, the Scriptures and see it in w today, and that really what's happening today as we look at all the riots and the rebellion and all the things that are taking place. Mankind loves to solve problems with the tree uh, and a branch, uh, a leaf much like Adam did. They want to cover it up, but he doesn't want to deal with the root of the problem. And so we end up chasing symptoms, and we see these symptoms all over the place from racism, looting, crime, broken families, addiction. We see all kinds of greed and abuse, murder, adultery, again and again and again. These are all of the things that are symptoms of a real root problem that's inside the heart of man. It is therefore impossible for a man to live peaceably with other men because they do not have peace with God. It just won't happen. And this is not unique to our continent. It's not unique to our country. It's not unique to our community. This is the world over. Romans 1, 18 through 320 helps us see a few things. And if you, I want to remind you of what we talked about, the three things that we saw in our last uh, time together when we looked at the book of Romans is that first part there is that I hope that as you look through that passage, the gospel will help you see yourself clearly, that we're all lost without hope and without God. But it doesn't stop there. Hopefully, as you see yourself clearly, you will also be able to listen humbly, You'll be able to hear other people's story and what they've gone through. No matter what color, no matter what race, no matter what gender, that we're able to see ourselves clearly and who we are and how God has made us and how we're flawed because of sin that indwells each of our hearts. And then we'll be able to listen to those around us humbly, not with arrogance, not with a distant um, 
uh, presence, but really with a, a tentative ear, listening to them humbly, seeing how God has worked in their lives. And then finally, as we do that, the gospel allows us to act graciously towards one another. And that's kind of leading us into this next section of the book of Romans, that when we see these things, when we allow ourselves to see ourselves clearly and listen humbly, that we'll be able to act graciously towards the, uh, those around us. Three uh, Romans 3, 21 through 31 is really a summary of the whole gospel. Um, if you were to memorize this section of scripture, if you were to really want to get a nutshell of what God is doing in the gospel, this is the section of scripture. In this passage, we said God demonstrates it to everyone of his attributes in bright, dazzling color. We see his sovereignty, his wisdom, his power, his love, his grace, his omniscience, his inclusive plan for redemption of all man, not just the Jew, but the Greek, the Gentile, all man, all race, everywhere. God's display of his power is there because it says, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made manifest. And Paul is going to unpack that in verses 21 through 31. When you get to 30 or 320, you're just exasperated. You're, you're defeated. It feels like doom. But then you get to verse 21 and it says, but now God and God works in such a powerful way that he leaves nothing unhindered, nothing uncovered. He takes care of everything. And we we see him clearly for who he is. And when we look at the creation story in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, we see this powerful, almighty God of creation and does all of these powerful, great things. They pale in comparison to what he does in chapter 3 of Romans 21 through 31. All of creation, it just looks like child's play. When you get to what God does in the, this verse, in this section of verses here of the saving of mankind. You know, I like to do yard work. For me, it's kind of fun uh, to watch things grow. I enjoy being outside, and it's a ton of work, especially as our experience was last week. We had a ton of hail that knocked down seemingly every leaf and branch from every tree within five houses of my house. We spent a whole day picking up leaves, and so normally, Yard work is fun, except that day. <laughs> but when you do yard work, you're always fighting these little things called weeds. And I'm sure you've done this. You go in the backyard, you see a weed, you reach down and you pull it out. And you know, the goal of pulling out a weed is real simple. You want to get it root and all. When you pull it out, you want to pull out from well below the soil. You want to get this long, ugly root that's there. We've all done this too. We reach down to pull out that weed and we end up just breaking off the top part of it and we leave in the root. And that root is terrible because what's going to happen in just a matter of days, it could be weeks, I don't know depends on the weed. That weed is going to grow back up unless you get the root. Until you get the root removed, the condition will not improve. And that's really what we're fighting in our culture today is we're trying to pull the weeds out, but we're not getting to the root of the problem. We're clipping off the top. We're getting to the, what we can see, but we're not getting the root. Until you remove the root, the condition will not improve. It just doesn't work. And this isn't the first time that we've had civil unrest in our country. This isn't the first time we've really had racial divisions exasperated, looting, riots, or tur turmoil. And we're not the only country who's had these. This happens the world over. See Rwanda in the 90s, see Venezuela in the 90s, Cuba, China, France, every single country on every continent, you'll see the same symptoms. Each new government, each so-called new movement, each leader of each party will say the same things and they'll deliver the same mess. None of them get to the root. Until the root is removed, the condition will not improve. Only God can remove the root. Chapter 3, 21 through 31. That's God removing the root. Only God can do this. We don't need a revolution. We need a return to Christ. We need a gospel penetration all the country over. This is the only thing that will work. This is the only root remover. Only Christ can remove the root. And that's what Paul is driving at in chapter 3, 21 through 31, is a focus on Christ. It terminates the root of our sin problem. It eliminates that and it reunites us with Christ. Our community, our state, our country, they need strong churches filled with people who are convinced of the same thing, that only Christ solves these problems. Only a revelation of who Christ is so we can see ourselves clearly, listen humbly, and act graciously can deal with the problems of sin and the root that is within. It has to start in the church. So I'm glad to see all those coming to church on a Sunday morning. I'm glad to see those focusing on their spiritual lives at home, watching videos like this. They're focusing on their relationship with Christ because it is you 
a Christian who represents Christ in your community. It's you as a Christian who, who shows the way of, of reconciliation, not just with man, but with God. You carry the gospel with you. And so if you're able to attend, attend. If you can't, watch, but never stop. The fate of our country rests not on an election. It's not on the dedication of those who, it rests solely on the dedication of those who claim Christ to remain faithful. So remain faithful. Continue to follow Christ until the remote the, the root is removed, the condition won't improve, and only Christ can remove that root. And so Romans 3, 21 through 31 reveals the glorious summary of the work of God through the ages. We are saved by grace through faith in Christ. Faith, that's it. That's all. It's a shocking comment. It's a shocking phrase. And it would have left the readers of this passage who were Jewish a little confused. What about Abraham? What about those who've gone before us? How were they saved? Because Abraham was circumcised. Abraham followed the law. He didn't follow the law. Abraham followed in obedience. How was he saved? And, and Paul is going to address that in this next section of Romans chapter 4. And so today I want to look at Romans 4 through 5. I want to show you what this is, but let me give you a summary statement for it first so that you kind of understand where I'm going. Through faith in Jesus, God has credited righteousness, which results in the forgiveness of sin that provides peace with God and purpose for the man who believes even in the darkest of days. And so this is a summary of this, this next section of scripture here. And it's a great passage. We don't have time in this short video to go through it all, but it gives you an idea that God is at work through faith in Christ and has credited righteousness to those who believe. And that power forgives sins. If you have your Bibles, swipe to or turn to Romans chapter four. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. I want to show you this word credited. It appears in this chapter several times. It's a lot. In fact, it's used 40 times in the New Testament, but 20 times in the book of Romans. And of the 20 times, it's used 10 times in this chapter. It's an important word. Look at the verse uh, 3 of Romans 4, 3. For it, what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. When you work for something, when you go to work, whether it's a salaried position, whether you're hourly, your boss pays you. He does not give you a check. You earned a check. He does not give you something you don't deserve. You deserve to be paid at the agreed price for your labor. You earned it. It's a trade. You give your employer your time and your energy, your skill and your hard work, and he gives you money. It's a trade. You have nothing to trade when it comes to God. We have no currency with God. He requires righteousness. And nothing will satisfy that unless we are righteous as he is righteous. But of course, we are filled with sin and the penalty of sin is death. So we have no footing. We have footing with our employer. We have footing with the job that we go to. We can make a trade. But when it comes to God, we have no standing. And so God gave something to Abraham. He did not earn or work to achieve. It was given to him not as a wage, but as a gift. All Abraham had to do was believe. He acted in faith. It was a gift. Just believe. And not just believe in some idea or some concept, but believe specifically in God. And upon that act alone, God credited, gave to Abraham, applied to his account, righteousness. Righteousness is the currency of heaven. You have to have it in order to enter into God's presence. It's required to enter into heaven. Without it, we are doomed. We are condemned without hope. And without God. And so, in essence, God says, if you want eternal life, you must be righteous without sin, past, present, or future sin. You must be perfect. Without righteousness, you will be cast out. And since all have sinned and fallen short, we fall short. Abraham precedes Moses. Moses gave us the law. Abraham did not follow the law. Abraham was way before Moses by hundreds of years. So, how did he have this righteousness applied to him? By faith. 
It was given to him as a gift because he believed in God. All he had to do was believe. But look at verse, what he, what he quotes there at the end of that section, he quotes a psalm. He quotes a psalm, and uh, the, the one I like, you go back to Psalm 32, and it, it says this, Psalm 32, 33 through 4, it says, this is David speaking about a sin that he held inside of him. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away Th through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me, and my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. We can relate to the heat of summer here in Odessa. It's so hot outside. And that's what David felt in his heart when sin was pressing in and down upon him. He withheld that sin and he did not seek restitution or seek reconciliation with God. He held it in. He did not confess. He held it in and his bones were just broken inside of his soul. He just could not function properly. But then he says towards the end of that, and you have it quoted for you there in Romans chapter four, it says it in verse seven, he says, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Look at that next verse. Blessed is the one whose, whose sin the Lord does not count against them and whose spirit is no deceit. He is set free when it comes to his sin, that forgiveness has come in and he is released because of faith in God, not in an institution, not in a government, not in another human or another act, but faith in God. This is what opens the, the floodgate of forgiveness into David. And this is what Paul cites here is that we have as a result of faith and that our sins have been forgiven. We had now have a relationship with God. You know, forgiveness is a powerful thing. It might be one of the most powerful things you can ever experience. And this is what God gives you. He removes that stain. He terminates and disarms that guilt. He extinguishes wrath. Forgiveness destroys barriers and it and opens up a pathway for a new standing for you and God. Forgiveness lifts up. It esteems the forgiven, but it does even more for the one who forgives. It exalts them. God's forgiveness brings us out of the depths of despair. We have a lot a tendency in the Christian world, I think, to, to really focus on the forgiveness of our sins. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't, but that's just one spot that we should pass through. We can celebrate the forgiveness of our sins, but God has something even more for us. You know, any married man who is wise will tell you, it is very uncomfortable to make your wife mad at you. It's a very awkward feeling. I don't like it at all. I've been married for 18 years, and granted, I've only upset Melanie just a couple times in those 18 years, but I remember them very well. Uh, and I didn't like it, and I'm sure on the occasion uh, that she has upset me, and I'm hoping that she didn't like that either. But it, it doesn't feel good. And so in a healthy relationship, that conflict is inevitable. It's going to happen. And you resolve that conflict. You approach your spouse, and you ask for forgiveness. You say, I'm sorry, you, you, and you, you reconcile that relationship. And then you put that event behind you. You, you. you move past it. But what would it be like if the husband groveled and thanked his wife every day for forgiving him? What if even a year after he's constantly going back to that one fight they had 365 days ago and saying, man, I'm really sorry about that. Thank you for giving me. What, what if that's where he parked that? What if the wife constantly reminded herself of her error and continued to thank her husband for that forgiveness, even months after the, the offense? What if the spouse continued to feel guilty, sorry, or ashamed, even after forgiveness and restoration had been given and it had been quite some time? Wouldn't the husband or wife eventually say, eventually say, hey, let's, let's move through this. Done. Forgiven. Let's go forward. That would be the healthy thing to do. And it's important to learn from the past, but we're called to live into the future. We're called to move forward. Sure, remember the past, but don't remain there. Reflect, but remember that you've been released. Remember the past offense too much or failing to move forward will hinder the marriage. It'll, you'll get stuck. I feel sometimes that might be what we do as Christians. We, we don't move through Romans chapter 4, 1 through 8, and we don't embrace what God has for us next. We get stuck in guilt and remorse, and we don't enjoy what God has given us in Romans chapter 5. And if you'll see that, you'll see a few things that God gives us in Romans chapter 5, 1 through 5. It says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also he obtained, we have obtained our introduction by faith into his grace in which we stand. And we exalt in the hope of, gl of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exalt in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. Perseverance, proven character, proven character, hope. 
and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Now notice it starts with that word therefore. That's an important marker inside of scripture. He's saying because everything previous is true, because Romans 3, 21 through 31 happened, because we have been forgiven and by faith, that's Romans chapter four, therefore a new standing we have with God. And he gives us at least three things here in this new standing that we have with God. Notice the first, that we have peace with God. This is an active peace and it's reciprocal. We have peace with God and God has peace with us. There is no longer wrath, animosity, anger. God is at peace with us. We're moving through that forgiveness phase. And although we remember it and we remember through communion, we remember what he paid, he wants us to live in peace with him. No more wrath, no more uh, condemnation, that we have peace with God. Righteousness is credited by faith, which results in the forgiveness of sin. And that establishes peace with God at all times. That phrase, that next phrase in there that says that we exult in the hope of the glory of God. I love this idea. You know, when it comes to survival, experts say there's a rule of three. I was reading about this this last week. You can survive three minutes without breathable air or in icy water. You can survive three days without drinkable water. You can survive three weeks without food. Now, I don't know, I'm not a survival expert, but I've gone a day without food and it's not a healthy scene for me or quite frankly, anybody around you. I can kind of define the word hangry when it comes to not food. So I might be able to get three hours without food, but these three things you have to have to survive physically, but there's something that you have to have to survive emotionally, spiritually, that you have to have even physically, if you don't have this, it's going to tear you up. And that is, you have to have hope. Without hope, you will die. Without hope, you will become depressed. Without hope, you will become discouraged. Without hope, you become despondent. You cannot survive anything without hope. And if you really listen to our news media today, this is all they talk about. Maybe there'll be a, a vaccine. That's called hope. Maybe a mask will save you. That's called hope. Maybe if we quarantine, that'll save us. That's called hope. I watched the SpaceX launch a few weeks ago and listened to some of the engineers and experts talk about the motor behind going to space and while they were doing this. And, and one of the engineers got on and he says, one of the main driving factors for this is we hope that we can get to Mars to avoid and survive the cataclysmic destruction that is coming upon the Earth. We want to colonize Mars because that's our last hope. Our last hope is to fly five or ten people to Mars. And that's our hope. That's pretty shaky ground if you ask me, but there's a lot of hope wrapped up in that. You cannot survive without hope. We are good at putting our hope in all the wrong things that don't deliver. Hopelessness, a loss of hope results in terrible, terrible emotional damage for us. If you were to ask anybody if they were going to go to heaven, they would most likely say, I hope so. And usually that word hope is if you drill down on that, you're going to say, well, what do you mean? They're going to say, well, I hope I've been good enough. Well, I hope I've done enough right things. I hope I have not been as bad as the other guy. I hope that I make that top 50% and get into heaven. I hope, I hope, I hope. It's a terrible place to place your hope because when you read scripture, you'll discover that it is hopeless. Except for the believer. The believer, and anybody can be, by faith, exalts or rejoices in hope because that hope is tied to the glory of God and God is glorified as he forgives us of our sins. God is glorified in Christ. And we have a reservoir of hope that can never be depleted because our hope is anchored not to a human event, concept, construct, institution, or some kind of an invention. Our hope is anchored to the glory of God and what he is able to do. We have hope. And when we have hope, we're able to even endure difficult times. That's the next thing he says in that passage there, is that we're able even to have joy in our tribulations because they are going to come. We're in the middle of them. As COVID goes up, as people become more and more concerned, we continue to go through this difficult trial, whether it's financial, physical, relational, all the things that are swirling around us, this fear that is just being given to us day by day by day by day through news media outlets and websites. It just feels this heaviness that's upon our souls. How do we get through this? Well, Paul says here that we have hope in God, that we have peace with God, we have hope in God, and we can rejoice even in our tribulations, that our tribulations are producing something inside of us. And he rattles off quite a list there in Romans chapter 5. If you look at that, he tells us what it produces, things that we all need. 
Our tribulations bring about perseverance and perseverance proven character, character, hope. And our hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who he has given to us. The Holy Spirit indwells those who believe. And it's not just a trickle. Notice the word poured there. It's not just a little drip that, the, that God is in his heavens just very, very carefully just dripping just enough of the Holy Spirit to get us through the day. The idea is that it is gushed inside of our hearts. It's poured into us. You know that scene, well, there's, if you were to be carrying a five gallon bucket of water and you were to drop it and that water just come gushing out, there's the Holy Spirit gushing into our souls. That's what we have. That's what our hope is tied to. It's because the Holy Spirit indwells us and he is able to take even the greatest of sufferings, the tribulations, difficult days of what we're going through today and whatever it might be in, in the future, because who has any idea of what this is going to look like in six hours, six days, and six weeks? It's a crazy time, but we have hope. We have hope in Christ because of Romans 3, 21 through 31 and what he has done by grace through faith because of, his, of who he is and how we can exult in our hope because it's in God. We have peace with God. We can have joy in our tribulation. We exult in these things. We rejoice because God has loved us. So how does this work tomorrow? What do we do with this information? I don't believe the Bible is supposed to be something read and studied on a Sunday and then shelved on Monday and then you go about it your, your day in a different way. I, I believe this is supposed to work for you tomorrow. And so the first thing is this, to the unbeliever, you have no hope. If you feel despondent, discouraged, and, and confused, you probably should be because you have not Christ. Christ is what removes the root and there's no improvement until you get to the root. And that is Christ. And so I invite you today to accept Christ as your Savior. All of these things are only going to become bigger and bigger all around us. Whether you're watching CNN, Fox News, whatever you're listening to on the radio, it's only going to cause more stress until you have Christ, until you can focus on Christ. And so I invite you to accept Him as your Savior. Simply acknowledge that you've sinned. Tell Him that you believe that He died on the cross for your sin and rose again. And invite Him to come into your life, into your heart. Believe in Christ. Embrace him today. Call us when you do. Send us an email. Let us know so that we might be able to encourage you. But that's the beginning. That's what removes that root of rebellion. Reconciles you to God so that you might have the hope that comes in Christ. Without it, you're hopeless. You should feel doomed because you are. And you need to embrace who Jesus is. And the offer is free for you to embrace right where you're at today. But to the believer, if you've already done that, I invite you to do this. Focus your hope. Focus your hope in Christ. We're tempted to anchor our hope in a scientist who will come up with a vaccine. Anchor our hope in a Supreme Court justice who will rule in alignment with our convictions. Or we're tempted to anchor our hope to an election where your guy wins. These are all shallow reservoirs. They run out. Every four years, they run out. And you're right back where you started. Each one is built on the words of men who shift, change, disappoint, or simply lie for personal gain. We all know this to be true. It's a terrible place for you to invest your hope. And so I'm asking you to focus your hope. Don't fall into this trap, always grasping for something new. You become addicted to the latest headline. Church, you're going to wear yourself out if you do that. You're going to end up depressed and angry, and no one's going to like you because that's what it is. You're depressed and you're angry and you're in a constant state of panic. Don't do that. Focus your hope. I'm not suggesting burying your head in the sand or ignoring our time. I'm suggesting that you spend more time away from the news than in it. I'm suggesting you find an outlet, not just inlets, find different ways to serve. I'm suggesting you spend time reading God's word more than Facebook or watching the news. Turn it off. God's word provides hope. God's word reminds you of what is to come, not what might come or could come. God's word is sourced in God and is rocket fuel for the Holy Spirit who's been poured out inside of your heart. Give him some of that. Spend your time in scripture. We've got a great Bible reading plan for you. You can download it at odessabible.org. It tracks along with what we're talking every Sunday. It gives you a psalm. It gives you another epistle. Uh, it's a great way for you to anchor your hope or focus your hope in something besides what's going on around you in the news or on Facebook or Instagram or whatever you're looking at that causes you that kind of stress. Redirect that stress. Focus 
on hope. And so my son was walking across the room the other day carrying a, a glass of water filled to the top. And he's walking, and as he's walking, he's staring straight at it, and that causes him to shake. And water is falling over, which of course I don't like inside the house. Who would? It's falling, it's shaking. And if you look at that cup, you're going to shake your hand and water's going to fall. And so how you walk across a room with a cup of water that's filled to the rim is real simple. You focus your eyes on where you're going. You look ahead, and it's amazing to me as I watch my son do that, as I watch other adults do that, if they would just take their eyes off of right here and focus forward, everything starts to level off, and they begin to walk calmly, and they begin to be able to handle what's in their hand with confidence, and they get to the other side. They focus their hope, not on the current circumstance of what's right here, but they focus on something bigger and better. They focus on the destination. So do that this week. Don't look at the right here and now so much to where you go so consumed by it that your hands start to shake. Look ahead. Focus on Scripture. Focus on the hope that God has given us in Christ and allow that to carry you through the day. Father, help us this week to focus our hope on you. Father, those who are listening who haven't embraced Christ, may they do so. Those of us who have, may we focus our hope in Christ. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fill and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chains are Forever, my. 